Good day. Today, 20th April, we are in the aftermath of the Israeli strike against Iran, and there is an echoing silence um, in Western capitals and in Jerusalem and Washington as to exactly what happened. So far, the Israeli government officially has not even confirmed its involvement, and the United States government is saying as little as it can. The only public comment which I have seen from an official, um, an, an actual official of either Israel or the United States, continues to be one made by security minister, Israeli security minister Ben Gvir. Now, apparently, he published a single comment Hebrew in Hebrew on his um, um, messaging in messaging in on uh, Twitter X. Um, this has been translated by um, in many different ways by many people. It's a, apparently a, a specific Hebrew word which clearly doesn't uh, isn't easy to translate precisely. But I've seen translations which say lame, feeble, weak, all to describe the Israeli attack on Iran. Now that is coming from Ben Gvir. He has apparently been severely taken to task by Netanyahu for publishing this comment. I understand other Israeli officials are furious with him as well. But... Apparently, he's sticking to his position, and certainly there is no reason to think that the attack that Israel launched against Iran was on anything like the scale of the one that Iran launched against Israel a week ago. Now, I'm not going to discuss in detail what little we know, very little we know, about the Israeli attack on Iran. I'm going to just make one, two quick observations. Firstly, in my discussions yesterday, in my program yesterday, I suggested, I, I said that it seemed as if the attacks which had taken place had been conducted by drones, and it looked as if two particular locations had been attacked, one in Isfahan, or near Isfahan, and the other in the northern town city of Tabriz. I now think that there was only one attack, and that it was on uh, the airfield near Isfahan. Um, it does seem, however, that Israel also launched uh, missiles at Iran, and these appear to have been air-launched missiles. In other words, missiles launched by F-35 fighter jets. The debris from some of these missiles has apparently been found in Iraq. And there's been some suggestions that the missile strike, which may have been the main attack, um, not the drone strike that we've been hearing so much about, that the missile strike specifically targeted a flap lid radar. This is a advanced radar developed by the Soviet Union for the S-300 system, the um, SAM-10 Grumble, as the Americans like uh, uh, refer to it as, as the NATO refers to it as. This is the system that some years ago, Russia, after much delay, finally supplied to Iran. And it's been suggested that this uh, radar forms part of the S-300 air defense missile complex, which is defending, protecting the Iranian nuclear facilities at uh, Natanz. Now, there's been much talk about whether or not this strike was successful. Um, Israel and the United States have produced no photos or pictures. 
Um, I read somewhere that CNN say that they have seen satellite pictures and that they can see no sign of any damage. But I haven't seen these satellite pictures myself and I'm not going to second guess the position. If there was a missile strike on a radar system like this, part of the S-300 complex defending Natanz, then, of course, that would suggest that there remains a potential a possibility that at some point, eventually, the is Israelis will attack the nuclear facility in Natanz, and it would appear that it remains in its sites, in Israel's sites. But, you know, all of this is very speculative because we don't really know. Now, there's been a very interesting article about the um, American response to the Israeli strike um, in Politico. Um, and it says that no one wants to escalate things. That's the title. And we're told that the instruction from within Washington has been to keep mum about Israel's Friday strikes on Isfahan. I would, before I proceed, say something. If the strikes really were um, intended to strike at this um, nuclear facility uh, in Natanz, that's around 100 kilometers from Isfahan. Isfahan may be the biggest city um, in the general vicinity of this nuclear facility. But I think um, it's not entirely accurate to talk about this nuclear facility as being in Isfahan itself. I mean, 100 kilometers suggests a certain distance away. Anyway, just saying. Uh, the airfield, presumably, is a lot closer. But anyway, the instruction from within Washington has been to keep mum about Israel's Friday strikes on Isfahan, three U.S. officials and an Israeli official said, who further noted that Israel had yet to comment on the response and that Iran has downplayed the incident. If the chest beating ends, they hope, so too might the latest Middle East crisis. No one wants to escalate things, said the Israeli official, who, like others, was granted anonymity to detail the thinking behind the silent approach. Well, no one clearly does not include Mr. Ben Gvir. As we see, he has broken the omerta, the code of silence, on this strike in Israel and in the United States. He's come and published that single word comment, which could be, which could mean lame, feeble, or weak, whatever you prefer. But anyway, um, we then go to read um, that the United States were informed of the strike at the last minute. Um, Biden himself has said, I'm not going to speak to anything other than to say that we were not involved in any, that's, sorry, not to Blinken. I'm not going to speak to anything other than to say we were not involved in any offensive operation. And um, um, Politico says the only on-record confirmation that in Israel was behind the strike has come from Italy's foreign minister, Antonio Tajani. <laughs> um, and um, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby didn't appear in front of reporters later in the day, though he's typically ever present following hinge moments in global crises. White House Press Secretary Catherine Jean-Pierre was left to repel question after question from reporters during the daily brief briefing, insisting that she needed to be mindful about not commenting on the attack. I don't have anything to share. And we're told that there is a possibility that President Biden or Prime Minister Netanyahu or some other senior leader will comment in the hours or days ahead, but there are currently no plans in the United States or Israel.
to develop a major, to, to, um, to deliver a major statement. And um, we have a quotation, a quote from Charles Lister. By the way, a notorious neocon, somebody who's always seeking um, to promote conflict, um, to my knowledge, and who's been a major um, hawk in terms of the Syrian conflict. Anyway, we have a quote from Charles Lister, senior fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington. This is far from being the devastating retaliation promised by so many in the Israeli war cabinet. Iran's swift denial of an attack could well be designed to shut the door too, but time will tell whether Iran's proxies are folded into that equation. And then we are told that um, whilst most of the officials Politico talked to stressed their relief that the attack was relatively limited, one expressed frustration that Israel didn't heed Biden's warnings to exercise more restraint and not counterattack. The United States begged Israel not to do it, and literally no one from the Pentagon to the Joint Chiefs to the CIA to the intel community thinks this is a good thing. At this point, it's truly embarrassing how much Israel does not listen to us, but yet this doesn't keep President Biden from blind fealty. Israel is playing a dangerous game, and it feels like Biden is putting us in the crosshairs, the official continued, reflecting anger expressed in other parts of the administration about the president's Middle East policy. And then we go on to read from Politico that the attention, once again, soon, is going to be refocused on the conflict in Gaza. Well... I think overall, this silence that we've seen in Israel and in the United States, and what little we're learning about the strike itself, does tell us that the strike was carried out in a very lim to only to a very limited degree, that there is a determination in Washington and Israel not to. Um, escalate the crisis further, um, not to get into a missile war of attrition with Iran, where Israel might find itself obliged to launch $1.3 billion worth of air defense missiles every night, night after night, with the risk that it could quickly run out of air defense missiles. Just saying. Anyway, um, whilst there's clearly a determination not to escalate the situation, it does seem to me that this overall picture ultimately confirms the point that I made in my program yesterday. The Iranians have come out ahead on points in this particular conf confrontation. They have publicly demonstrated their resolve. Resolve is an important part of deterrence. The Iranians have shown that they do have a capability to strike at targets in Israel, and they've shown that they are willing, if pushed, to do it. Israel, by contrast, and the United States, whilst they have shown that they have a capability, obviously, to strike at Iran, have displayed a nervousness and insecurity, um, which suggests that their resolve, at least for the moment, is not as strong. And that tilts the balance of advantage in this particular crisis firmly in favor of Iran. Now, I'm going to now <laughs> make a point which, of course, um, I've made in the past, but I'm going to do, going to make that point again. 
I well remember how directly after the 7th of October, after President Biden visited Israel, when he returned to the United States, he gave what I thought was one of the most disastrous Oval Office addresses I have ever heard in my lifetime. And one of the most singular facts about that Oval Office address is that even as there had been a, an attack by Hamas on Israel itself, in which over a thousand people had died and hostages had been taken, he actually used, devoted a large part of his address to discussing instead the conflict in Ukraine, a completely unrelated, unconnected matter. And I said at the time that it was absolutely clear to me that Ukraine remains for President Biden the main overriding obsession and priority. Astonishing as it may seem to many people in the United States and in Israel itself, Israel, the conflict in Gaza, the conflict between Israel and Iran is a lesser priority for this president than the conflict in Ukraine. And this brings us directly back to the reason why this administration, this president, are anxious to keep the situation in the Middle East under control, why they do not want it to escalate into a situation of all-out war. And that is because, as we read every day in various media outlets, as we hear from various US officials, there is a military crisis developing in Ukraine, and there is also a crisis in terms of uh, Ukraine's air defense situation. Ukraine's air defense missile complex has, to all intents and purposes, collapsed. The Russians are in a position to strike at Ukraine in any way and manner that they choose. Their air force is now active on the front lines. Their missiles are striking wherever they choose to strike, anywhere in Ukraine. And the United States, the administration, the Biden government, the um, establishment wing of the Republican Party led by Mitch McConnell, the intelligence community, they have been pulling every stop to try to get Congress to authorize more funding for Ukraine, more appropriations for Ukraine. They've been trying to badger the Europeans to provide more systems, especially air defense systems to Ukraine. And, well, we've seen some of the results with Speaker Johnson's vault fast, his decision to go from a position that he seemed to be strongly um, sticking to for months and weeks, that there would be no funding for Ukraine unless the crisis on the US border was sorted out first, to a position which he has adopted suddenly, out of the blue, <laughs> over the last couple of days, whereby um, the United States is now confronted by the new axis of evil, China, Russia, and Iran. I would have thought, by the way, that after ha what happened following President uh, George W. Bush's axis of evil speech <laughs> and the consequences of that, um, U.S. Polit politicians and, and officials would want to avoid reviving that particular term. But anyway, Speaker Johnson has now um, come back to it. Anyway, he now says that support for Ukraine has suddenly become the priority. And the problems of the border, well, it seems that they're not quite so pressing after all. So anyway, the point is that the administration, the president, most of official Washington, their overriding obsession and focus at the moment is Ukraine. And as we know, there is a major shortage of air defense 
missile interceptors. There's only a finite supply of them. The United States only produces 550 of them in any one year. Um, apparently, that number may increase to around 650 if this new authorization package is passed, or rather when it is, <laughs> because I consider that a foregone conclusion, even though it hasn't been passed as of the time of making of this program. But anyway, um, one way or the other, there is a shortage of air defense missiles. And given the overriding priority being given to Ukraine's needs for air defense missiles, the United States cannot afford a missile war between Israel and Iran because that will simply compound the existing shortage of air defense missile in interceptors and leave fewer for Ukraine. And I think this is a fact which few people seem to have taken on board. But the key reason, the overriding reason why the administration has put so much pressure on Israel to, in effect, give Iran a win is because their priority continues to be Ukraine. Now, let's swivel, let's now pivot and go to a discussion of these appropriation bills. Now, um, there was a vote um, late yesterday, whereby apparently um, the House voted on a procedural motion to proceed with these bills, and a vote is expected for them sometime today. By the time you're watching this video, that vote might already have happened. Judging on the voting numbers that I've seen, it is a foregone conclusion that all of these votes will pass. Judging by the voting numbers I have also seen, and by the comments some of their, them are making, a very substantial block indeed of Republicans in the House of Representatives are furious about what has happened and are vocally complaining about it and are speaking about their incomprehension and sense of betrayal over Speaker Johnson's Voltfass. I've discussed how um, this has also been reflected in those parts of the media that reflect the positions of the populist wing of the Republican Party. I, I quoted from the Federalist, for example, yesterday, but even those comments in the Federalist are as nothing compared to some of the angry comments which I see coming out of the Republican conference in the House of Representatives. And as I said, something like, I believe it was around 90, between 90 and 100 Republicans voted against this procedural motion. And it seems to me, given that number, the only way that Speaker Johnson can remain Speaker after this affair if the populist wing of the Republican Party sticks to its position that he must uh, be removed as Speaker because of this betrayal. The only way that he can remain Speaker is if the Democrats in the House of Representatives choose to support him, either by voting for him or abstaining on a vote. Now, that would be an astonishing event were it to happen. I would suggest it would also be a very clarifying one. It would actually show that the priorities of a certain wing of the Republican Party are very different from those of its core base and of the majority of Republicans in the House of Representatives. And looking forward, 
as somebody who always likes clarity and simplicity in political conflicts, um, and who thinks that overall it is a good thing, well, if that eventually leads to some kind of a realignment in the United States, that might not be an altogether bad thing. And, of course, the full consequences of that, no doubt, will play out, not immediately, but over the next few months and perhaps years. I ought to add that the Democrats have shown an astonishing degree of self-confidence over the last 24, 48 hours. Um, they clearly feel that they have the McConnell wing of their party essentially in their pocket. And the sign of that is not only that they refuse to make any concessions on the border at all, but more importantly, that they simply threw out, without even so much as a vote or a discussion, the articles of impeachment sent to them by the Republican House of Representatives um, against Homeland Security Secretary uh, Mayorkas. Um, something which, to my knowledge, has never happened before. When um, there are impeachment articles sent by the House to the Senate, um, usually the Senate at least goes through the motions of considering, considering them. This time, um, Senator Sch uh, Schumer and the Democrats in the Senate just tossed them out, and they did that apparently confident in the knowledge that that isn't going to affect the voting today on the various appropriations bills, despite the fact that, as I said, there is no um, movement by the Democrats on the question of the border. I was reading, I think it was the American Conservative, a suggestion that if the Republicans are able over the course of the next few days to somehow amend these standalone bills and tack on some um, proposals that Speaker Johnson is separately making about the, the border, if they're able to tack them on to the Ukraine appropriations bill, then that bill will die in the Senate because the, the Democrats in the Senate will not support it. But to be frank, I don't think there's a snowball's chance in hell of that happening. Anyway, let's just make a number of observations about this. Firstly, there's been a lot of discussion about the reasons for Speaker Johnson's vault fast. I've suggested that he has come under colossal pressure from the committee chairs in the House, who are, of course, establishment Republicans, and who are very, very keen to get this funding for Ukraine. There's an awful lot of attention being given to a meeting which apparently Speaker Johnson had with the heads of the US intelligence community. And there's all sorts of lurid claims circulating surrounding that meeting. I am not going to comment on those claims. I know nothing about them. I get to actually express here my own view. I think the Speaker Johnson did come under enormous pressure. I think he understood that his position as Speaker would fail eventually if he stuck to the, stuck to the position that he had previously taken on this affair. But listening to him and watching him. I have to say this, I think he is doing that which deep down he has always wanted to do. I, he's not a particularly well-known or wasn't a particularly well-known political figure before he became speaker. There's no reason to think that he was someone who particularly opposed 
what was the overwhelming mainstream opinion in the United States within the political class, which is to support Ukraine to the ultimate point. That doesn't seem to have been his feelings. I suspect, deep down, he has always wanted to approve a spending package for Ukraine. It is consistent with his visceral views and beliefs. He has always felt uncomfortable with the position of holding out for concessions on the border um, and refusing to allow the funding for Ukraine to move forward um, until concessions on, on the border take place. The fundamental problem that opponents of funding for Ukraine have in the United States, in Congress, is that they are a minority in Congress. They were never a, the Republicans, the populist wing of the Republican Party, was never able to find someone from within its, uh, from within its group who was able to get enough support within the Republican conference to be elected speaker. Um, so Johnson, relatively unknown figure, but one with a reputation of having in the past been loyal to Donald Trump, was the best they could do. He was, in effect, a compromise candidate. But it's never been the case, as I say, that he has ever really been someone whose heart has been in this matter, in this manner, in this matter. So there we are. Anyway, moving on, there is something I now really must say, which is that over the last few hours, in fact, shortly before I did this programme, I came across an absolutely brilliant, completely excoriating analysis and discussion of these funding issues for Ukraine and of the security issues for Ukraine provided by Bruce. Well, I apologise to him. I'm not entirely sure how his name is uh, um, to be um, pronounced, but Bruce Slaughter, S-L-A-W-T-R. It's an absolutely brilliant, excoriating uh, um analysis, discussion of this whole issue of the United States' policies with respect to the war in Ukraine and funding of the war in Ukraine. Now, the thing to understand is that Bruce Slaughter um, is a senior U.S. military officer, or was one. I believe his rank is Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, he's now retired. Um, he was, for many years, 25 years, if my memory serves me rightly, he worked in the capacity of a military attaché. And he had very, very close contacts with both the Russians and with the Ukrainians as a military attaché posted, presumably, to both of these countries. So he knows the Russian military, he knows the Ukrainian military, he understands the situation. He is, in other words, an expert. He's an expert because he's an army officer, former army officer. He is an expert because he has diplomatic experience of the relevant countries. He is an expert because he has experience as a military officer of the two militaries involved in this war. One of my major points of grievance, if you like, about Western policy with respect to this entire conflict in Ukraine and this entire confrontation with Russia is that the experts, the true, genuine experts, are not being listened to. They're not being heeded. Instead, we have a whole 
bunch of people who are referred to as experts, people like the former US ambassador to Moscow, Michael McCall, people like Fiona Hill, lots of others, who, in my opinion, are not experts at all. They are people with very strongly held opinions, but having strongly held opinions does not in itself make you an expert. Now, if you go and read these documents, one of which, by the way, is a letter addressed to Speaker Johnson, <laughs> um, and you will find these documents on um, Colonel Slaughter's um, Substack um, blog. I should say, um, I think it's a new blog. It's, um, it's called Blue Eagle at Dawn. It's relatively, I think it is um, fairly new, but you can go there and you can read them. They're long, deeply analytical, very powerful documents. If you go there, you will find that this person who is an expert, let me repeat that again, who is an expert, he sets it all out in complete, clear detail. These documents, these two documents, are not only a truly outstanding and actually, by the way, compelling read, they dissect brilliantly everything that has been wrong about the way in which this policy of the United States and um, of the Western powers has been managed <laughs> and conducted. If you want to get you know, a clear overview of someone who, as I said, is an expert, who knows the militaries, who knows the countries, who I'm guessing perhaps speaks the languages, I don't know that for a fact, but anyway, if you want to see that, just go and read at Blue Eagle at Dawn and see what he says. Now, let's move on. <laughs> let's discuss what this funding package is going to do. Well, it will make a difference. We're getting reports that the Pentagon is already hurriedly putting together a package of weapons to send to Ukraine um, and um, that this will include extra ammunition and um, air defense missiles, Patriot re uh, um, reloads presumably for the Patriot air defense missiles, perhaps a whole complete Patriot system, which we'll no doubt find out soon. Um, one of the points that Colonel Slaughter makes, by the way, is that the effect of all of these um, new deliveries uh, will only start to weigh on the events in the battlefronts over a period of several weeks, perhaps months, especially, I suspect, in terms of new deliveries of Patriot systems. But anyway, moving on. But to re reiter reiterate, it will make a difference it will slow the progress of the Russians. It cannot change the ultimate direction of travel or of the war. The fundamental problem is that the United States and the Western powers, as a result of the enormous changes that have happened in their industrial systems since the 1960s and 1970s, are no longer in a position to produce weapons in the quantities that a conflict like this requires. Just to make a point, which I think perhaps ought to be made, the reason the Biden administration ran out of funding to continue to support Ukraine in the autumn was because they had miscalculated the amount of funding and the amount of weapons Ukraine would need. They had already provided, before the president asked for the $61 billion package 
in October. They had already provided to Ukraine huge quantities of weapons and funding and shells and all of those things, huge quantities, as they thought, more than enough to hold the Russians at bay, only it turned out otherwise. And that was why they had to come back and ask for more. Over the course of Ukraine's summer offensive, it became quickly clear that Ukraine was firing more shells than the United States had bargained for. There was a shortage of unitary shells, and the United States found itself obliged to supply shells with cluster munitions, which turned out to be insufficient and inadequate for the task. So that is the underlying problem. Throwing money at the problem isn't going to solve the problem. It is going to increase costs, because it always does, if you allocate more funds to buy things that are in finite quantity, all that you're going to do is increase the costs of the items you buy. What is happening is that the United States is running, not exactly to stand still, but to catch up with a moving train which has already accelerated out of the station. It will never be able to catch up. There is no catch up in this affair. Now, I say that the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, has been continuing his visits to various factories. He recently visited the tank production factory in Omsk. This is one of the major tank production factories um, that the Soviet Union created. It was the tank factory that produced the bulk of the T-80 tanks that the Soviet Union began to bring into service in the late 1970s, and which still form a significant part of the Russian military. This is the tank which the Russians produced with a gas turbine engine, which, by the way, <laughs> for the record, is the first tank in the world to be produced with a gas turbine engine, or at least the first tank with such an engine to go into service. That its philosophy is profoundly different from that of the US Abrams tank. Anyway, the key point to say is that Omsk for years had been mothballed. Production of the T-80 tank ceased back in the 1990s, as I remember. The factory did sporadic work trying to keep um, some of the old T-80 tanks that were being produced, trying to refurbish them. Though for some years, the official policy of the Russian military was to scrap the T-80 entirely and to focus exclusively on the T-72 being built at the other big factory, tank factory, Oral Vagon Zavod in the Urals. Anyway, um, to focus on the T-72 and its evolutions, the T-90 and the T-90M, you can find detailed discussions of all of this in Jim Kinnear's indispensable books. He discusses the T-80, the T-90, and of course he also discusses the T-72. And you can learn from those books the differences between these tanks. Anyway, the point was, Omsk had been mothballed. Now, if you look at the pictures now, you see a tank factory that is humming with activity. And there's pictures of rows upon rows of T-80s. These are old T-80s, probably mostly from the time of the Soviet Union. But they've been gutted, they've been opened, they're being massively modernized, they've then been screwed together again um, with new electronic equipment, apparently equipment developed to jam drones. That's apparently now becoming 
integral to Russian tanks. Anyway, all of that is there, and this factory once mothballed, then in a state of low-level activity, is now back in production on a huge scale. And there's lots of talk that production of the T-80, new production of the T-80, will shortly resume. Apparently, the first um, examples of the gas turbine engine have now been produced. And I, I, underst I understand they were even shown to Shoigu. And <laughs> another tank factory, in other words, has been brought back into life. To my mind, that illustrates the realities right across the Russian industrial system. It has tremendous surge capacity. It has ability to expand. There are more than enough um, workers with the necessary skills to work in these factories. Many of these workers, by the way, are women, just saying. And this is especially true in the factories which make the shells and which assemble the shells and in the explosives factories. Anyway, um, production is therefore gearing up. And in fact, we've seen pictures not just of a massive, well, perhaps not quite production line, but refurbishment line in Omsk of T-80s. And um, we've also seen pictures of railway, uh, of trains, shipping, what look like unending numbers of T-90Ms and T refurbished T-72s and T-80s to... Um, from these factories to the front lines. Now, the United States, the Western powers, as I've discussed many times, as Brian Belletic has also discussed many times, do not have that surge capacity. It can be reconstructed, it can be recreated, but that would be a labor of years. It would also require the United States and the European states to engage in practices of industrial planning and state control, which are, to put it mildly, alien to the way they manage their economies. So yes, it can be done with the necessary resources. That's not to say, by the way, that it will be done but it cannot be done in any way that will alter the course of this war. And besides that, it can't be done with the necessary, with the, with the sort of funds we are seeing coming out of Congress at the moment. It's deeply frustrating to what an extent people still seem unable to grasp this. People like J.D. Vance do, but many others don't. They continue to look at nominal GDP figures. They see that Russia, according to nominal GDP, has got an economy smaller than Spain's, or is it Italy's, or Malta's, <laughs> I forget which. Um, whereas what they ought to be looking at are things like factory space, production numbers, availability of skilled workers, engineering um, resources, products, the various uh, availability of the products, the products that make weapons, steel, the other metals, the ingredients, that make for explosives. I, I was reading recently, for example, that um, cotton fiber, which is what the West, which, which is an indispensable ingredient for making explosives, the, the, the type of cotton fiber that is needed to do that in the West is principally imported from China. We can already see 
problems with that. I'm not saying that the Chinese are restricting exports or have been asked by the Russians to restrict exports. I'm merely saying that the US government itself will probably be nervous about relying on that source for exports of this kind of imports of that kind of cotton fiber. Whereas the Russians have a massive ability to import cotton fiber from Central Asia, the various states of Central Asia, many of which are of course connected to China, to Russia, through the Eurasian Economic Union, and the most important of which, Uzbekistan, has been working to mend its fences with Russia over the last few years. So the Russians have no shortage of the various inputs they need to increase production. And because they have simpler management systems and because their factories are state-owned and are not therefore focused on profit in the same way, Brian Boletic has discussed that at superb length, it is much, much easier for them to undertake surge production capacity, which is what we're seeing. And this isn't only, obviously, with things like tanks and armoured vehicles and shells and guns and all of those things. The Russians are also surging production of drones and they're sh surging production of other things too. Obviously, the higher end a military product is, fighter jets, for example, the less it, the more difficult it becomes to multiply production rates. Uh, a Sukhoi 35 fighter jet is an enormously complex piece of equipment. You need all kinds of inputs to be able to produce it in greater numbers. And, well, production there might be doubling, but it's not going to increase by the 10 or 20 fold as some other products do. But as has become clear from this war, it is the ability to maintain surges that ultimately determines the outcome. And the Russians already have well-established production lines, for example, for air defense missiles. They're already saying that they produce more than three, time, three times more air defense missiles than the world combined, which is probably true, by the way. They can probably, they can certainly increase more than that. They have pools of trained manpower and the engineering and management skills to do that. And they have also shown that they have the ability to serially produce in huge quantities cruise missiles which are proving so deadly in their effect on the battlefronts. So Congress can throw money at the problem. The administration can do that. It cannot change the outcome of the war. It can cause delay. It can slow the process. To my mind now, the entire objective is to prevent a Ukrainian collapse before the November election. And it's fascinating, by the way, that there is a powerful faction within the Republican Party that is also apparently anxious to help the administration prevent a Ukrainian collapse before the election, just saying. But anyway, um, they can slow the inevitable outcome. They can't prevent it because the realities, the production realities, are so different. Now, let's move on and turn to what's actually happening on the battlefields. And the first thing to say is that there's been a lot more information about that massive Russian missile strike that I discussed yesterday. And one of the things that is now standing out for me is that it is clearly being targeted increasingly, not just at Ukraine's um, energy facilities and its military industrial complex and 
its military infrastructure, but that the Russians are now starting to target transport modes, railway stations, um, railway sidings, things of that kind. And the focus appears to have been, of the, late, of the previous attack, appears to have been um, appears to have been Dniepro, as I discussed yesterday. It looks as if the Russians have also um, attacked um, in a big way Zaporozhye as well. There's a possibility that they could launch uh, there's, it seems there's been a follow up another follow up strike over the last few hours. This was specifically focused again on the Odessa area. Anyway, these strikes are taking place on a simply enormous scale. And I have to say this, um, I'm not sure what this is true. I don't want to um, make predictions or second guess what the Russian Defence Ministry and the General Staff are thinking, but increasingly the pattern of these Russian strikes is of a kind that one might expect if it is indeed the Russian objective at some point this summer to launch some kind of offensive. Just saying. Anyway, we will see what the Russians actually do. But anyway, another devastating and colossal missile strike and no doubt we will be getting more strikes of that kind over the course of the next few days. I discussed yesterday how it seems that another three, three S-300 la uh, launches have been destroyed and the Russians seem to be able now to strike anywhere, it, you, anywhere they wish in Ukraine at will. And in most places, the air defense system there no longer functions. As I said, they will no doubt be, Ukrainians will no doubt be provided with more air defense systems by the United States and the European powers before long. Jens Stoltenberg is now saying that things are so urgent that the Europeans specifically should actually give more of their air defense systems. They should be prepared to essentially give up <laughs> their air defense systems, go below even the um, fail-safe targets, uh, 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 the fail-safe limits that um, NATO um, requires them to do. They should give up, they should go below that. They should, in other words, denude themselves of air defense capability in order to supply Ukraine. But think how quickly Ukraine has burnt through all the air defense systems that it was supplied last year. And why suppose, given the enormous increase in Russian missile strikes and the growing tempo of those strikes, why think that any more supplies of air defense missiles are going to result in any different outcome, that those um, air defense missiles won't be lost or expended at at least a similar or even greater rate. And I discussed in my program yesterday how the Russians claimed that they shot down 10 Attackums missiles in the week leading up to Friday. <clears throat> I now understand that only seven of those Attackums missiles, seven out of 12, were shot down over the Jankoy base. The Russians um, have been saying that they were able to shoot down three more Attackums missiles launched over the uh, course of the following hours. They were shot down over the Black Sea. 
Um, it seems five Attackers missiles did reach the Jankoi base. Photographs have now appeared showing some damage to the Jankoi base, but impossible to assess that damage. And no proof from the pictures that I have seen that any air defence batteries were actually uh, destroyed in that attack, despite Ukrainian claims. And in fact, the evidence suggests, as I said already, that the air defence batteries were withdrawn from the base, from the immediate area of the base, before the attack took place. The point is, 10 Attackums missiles shot down, Attackums not in production. Ukraine will be burning through its Attackums missiles when they're supplied, as well as the Storm Shadows and the others. There is no way the United States or the West can keep up with Ukraine's needs. They're disarming themselves now faster than um, they can keep Ukraine itself supplied with weapons. And again, all of this may make sense to do, given the needs to keep Ukraine going past the election. But one does question the underlying logic of acting in this way. Now, anyway, another big missile strike last night on top of the even bigger missile strike that took place over the previous day. We've had more news from the battlefronts. There's been more reports again. This is the third time I think I've seen these reports that Novomikhailovka Mikhailovka has now been fully occupied by the Russian military. Well, we'll have to see whether that is really so. But again, the most important news continues to come from the Avdevka sector. It looks like the Russians uh, not only are um, now consolidated in Ocheretino, they're bombing the village heavily, and they seem to be expanding their area of control. Reports yesterday that the Ukrainians have finally thrown in the towel with Berdichi, and rather than allow the 47th Mechanized Brigade, or what's left of it, which has been defending Berdichi for months, and before that, Stepovoye, further east, by the way. Anyway, they've now withdrawn what's left of that brigade, and apparently are planning to redeploy it to Chasif Yar, um, rather than allow it to be encircled. It is too precious an asset to be lost in that way. So it is likely that Berdichi also will fall under Russian control, or at least the Russians will announce that they control Berdichi at some point over the next couple of days. The Russians have also apparently um, advanced further from the north towards Krasnogorovka. Um, the Ukrainian troops in the pocket south of Pervomaisky and north of Nevolskoy. They've also um, been rapidly withdrawn to prevent encirclement. The Russians clearly in control of a significant part of Krasnogorovka now, and they're advancing on Krasnogorovka from the north. The ground is harder. Russian armored units are able to move more quickly, we see that they're starting to receive integrated jammers to defend them against drone attacks. We'll see how effective those jammers are. But one way or the other, to repeat again, the pace of operations on the battlefronts is accelerating. And going back to other parts of the front lines, there have been reports of further Russian advances in the Terni area, near the Zherebets River. This was the place where the Ukrainians were supposed to have won that great battle, destroying an entire armoured force of the Russians. Some said up to 30, others said up to 100 um, Russian armoured vehicles had been destroyed. Um, all kinds of, I suspect, heavily edited films were produced to confirm that. There's no doubt that a Russian armoured advance was stopped and suffered damage, but 
claims of a successful Ukrainian counterattack or expectations of a successful Ukrainian counterattack in this area do not seem to have been fulfilled. The Russians have resumed advances again, maybe now that their jamming equipment is becoming more widespread and perfected and as their counter-artillery duels in the area have taken out more of Ukraine's artillery. And in the Bakhmut area around Chasov Yar, fighting continues with the same levels of intensity. We don't know, again, exactly what has happened around Chasov Yar because there's been far fewer reports about it. But as I've said on many occasions, the mere fact that we are not receiving direct information from the battlefronts does not mean <laughs> that events are not, the things are not happening in any particular location. We sh saw during the siege of Avdevka, the sudden advance of the Russians into southern Avdevka, which had not been predicted or expected, and which revealed that there had been Russian advances already which had gone unreported. We've just seen exactly the same thing happened in the Ocheretino, Novokalinova, um, Keramik area, north of um, Avdevka. The Russians suddenly entering Ocheretino itself, having captured the Zarya Dacha community area to the south. The Russians now apparently um, occupying a significant part of Novo Kalinova to the east of Ocheretino. The Russians apparently even now apparently starting the storming of the village of Novo Bakhmutivka to the west of the railway south of Ocheretino. These advances, this sudden advance to the north clearly began earlier than many reports, than reports might lead one to think. And the surprise of many of the commentators and bloggers and reporters and telegram channels about these sudden advances is not a reflection of the fact that these advances have been as sudden as they appear. It is rather a reflection of the fact that we only get a limited amount of reporting from the battlefronts. Anyway, there we go. That's the situation um, in um, the battlefield situation in Ukraine. Continued deterioration of the situation overall for the Ukrainians. Still lots of uncertainty about whether there will be a big Russian offensive in the summer. Um, the a, a drama playing out in Washington over an appropriations bill, which I have certain will be passed. By the way, I would point out that the Russians themselves have always said that they expect, the six, they, ex, they always expected that the $61 billion package would eventually pass. Glenn Deason and I on the Duran have interviewed Deputy Ambassador Dmitry Polyansky, uh, who is part of Russia's diplomatic team at the United Nations, over the course of both of those interviews, Polyansky said that he expected, and by implication the Russians expected, and had already factored into their calculations. the certainty that the $61 billion package would eventually be approved. I'm just saying. So, despite all that drama, the grinding, the collapse in Ukraine continues. Um, Zelensky himself has just visited Chasov Yar, apparently, before flying to Europe to attend this air defence conference. Um, where he's likely to receive more air defense missiles. That's a 
the West rapidly going through its stockpile. And, well, the war goes on. It's a little like watching a tidal wave come in. For those who haven't seen what tidal waves, actual tidal waves look like, you can look at some of the film from the recent tidal waves in Japan. It's basically a flood. It rises steadily, slowly, but the idea that many people have that there's a huge wall of water well, it's typical of some tidal waves, but not of most of them. But that's the impression I get of a steady rise on the Russian side of that tidal wave of men and machines putting extra pressure. And what the Americans and the Western powers and the Ukrainians are trying to do is to build up dikes and defences even as the flood comes in. Anyway, let's conclude with a massive interview that the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, has now just given to Russian media channels. And this is an interesting interview because in it, Lavrov um, discusses the prospect of negotiations as a means to end the war. And I am going to make here a speculative guess that one of the things that the United States, the Biden administration is going to do over the next couple of weeks, once the $61 billion package has been passed, is that they're going to try and again interest the Russians in the settlement freeze idea. I think deep down the administration and the Pentagon understand that this is a war that cannot be won. And I think that as much as anything, they see the $61 billion package as a means of getting leverage over the Russians to try to persuade the Russians to come to terms on a freeze. Anyway, Lavrov addresses all this head on. He makes it very clear that the Russians, while they're prepared to negotiate, they are not prepared to negotiate with Zelensky himself. That possibility is now exhausted. They consider Zelensky to be an unreliable negotiator. They're still burnt by their experience of what happened in Istanbul. And Lavrov essentially says that the negotiation must be with the West, because unless the West is involved, any deal done could be torpedoed by the West in exactly the same way as the negotiation at Istanbul was torpedoed. He makes it clear that a minimum turn for the Russians will be Ukrainian withdrawal from all the territories that make up the four regions, the fighting, the area that, um, the area, the, the, the border, if you like, cannot be the current line of contact. It must include all the administrative territories of the four regions. That includes Kherson city beyond the, on the west bank of the Dnieper and Kherson region west of the Dnieper. It includes Zaporozhye city in Zaporozhye region. It includes, of course, the whole of Donbass, um, including Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, Pakrovsk, and all the others. He talks a lot about Russians, Russia's need for a buffer zone, he drops a very heavy hint that the Russians are indeed interested in Kharkiv, though of course he doesn't discuss military operations. He makes it quite clear 
that any idea of Ukraine joining NATO is a complete non-starter. Jeff Roberts, um, British historian, has suggested that with the Russians now on the brink of winning the war and in return for cast iron guarantees about the non-deployment of Western troops in Ukraine, might agree to Ukraine entering NATO, what's left of Ukraine, entering NATO as part of some sort of, uh, as a deal to end the war. Well, I strongly got the sense that, Lav well, Lavrov makes it all but clear that that isn't any anywhere close to what the Russians themselves are thinking. Lavrov further makes the point, by the way, about the Istanbul agreements, that the moment when the Russians began to realize that the Istanbul agreements were on the brink of collapse was when the Ukrainians came back and tried to modify the security guarantees that they would receive under the terms of the Istanbul agreements to allow NATO soldiers to be introduced into Ukraine without the Russians having a veto over that happening. And this is clearly unacceptable to the Russians. And it was the first indicator for the Russians that the Istanbul talks were about to collapse. Um, Lavrov again goes through the actual agreements that were reached at Istanbul. I'm not going to repeat them. Um, many are saying that the Russians agreed to retreat back to the February 2022 lines. I have never seen any confirmation of that from any Russian source. And I'm going to say straight away, I do not believe that that was part of the text of the Istanbul agreements. Just say. And going beyond, um, going beyond all of this, Lavrov also again makes clear his bitter anger and the Russians' bitter anger at the unending catalogue of deceptions that the Western powers engage, have engaged in with respect to the Russians. He makes it absolutely clear that the Russians do not trust the West in any conceivable way. That, of course, makes it inconceivable that they will agree to any proposal for Ukraine to enter NATO with guarantees about non-deployment of troops because the Russians know that they can't rely on those guarantees. Just say. But anyway, um, he makes it clear that because of that lack of trust, the Russians will continue the special military operation. Even if negotiations take place, there will certainly be no ceasefires or anything of that kind. There will be no interruption of military activity. But if the Ukrainians want, or the Western powers better still want, to come and talk, well, the Russians are prepared to talk, though the terms they will insist on, based on what Lavrov says, are very harsh. And, well, there are a lot of other things. Um, Lavrov continues to be incensed by what he sees as the duplicity of the Western powers. He says that the Swiss, ha the Swiss have been circulating uh, proposals, or supposedly circulating proposals, that about Russia participating in this peace conference that Switzerland is seeking to set up in June. And there are claims from the Swiss that they actually invited the Russians to attend this peace conference. Lavrov goes out of his way to say that that is completely untrue. The Swiss foreign minister, whom he met in January at the United Nations, 
suggested, told him, invited him to the conference on this basis, that the conference would first take place, there would be a conference, Russia would not participate after the main part of the conference had ended, then the Russians would be invited to attend, presumably in order to be given the results of the conference, which would then be presented to them on a take-it-or-leave-it ultimatum basis. And Lavrov said to the Swiss foreign minister, you simply can't be serious, and this isn't going to happen. So that, apparently, according to Lavrov, is what really took place there. He is also furious that um, Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, has now been spreading stories that the Chinese are interested in the June conference. Um, he says that, in reality, the Germans are simply misrepresenting comments made by Xi Jinping that an international conference should eventually be set up to sort out the problems of Ukraine as somehow signalling China's intention to participate in the June conference in Switzerland. Actually, if you go to the Chinese readout, the actual Chinese readout, you can see that the distinction Lavrov is making is clearly there in the Chinese readout of the discussion between Scholz and um, Xi Jinping. And overall, I got the impression that the Russians are in an absolutely implacable mood. They see or sense that the war is going their way. They see no reason to stop. They say they won't stop. They say they've been lied to and tricked far too many times. They want all of their demands, the original demands set out by Putin in February 2022 to be met and they're not prepared to stop until the moment comes when Ukraine capitulates and accepts that demand and if that happens over the course of a negotiation well so be it but the Russian advance will continue in the meantime and notwithstanding Basically, what Lavrov is talking about again is Istanbul Plus. But it is an Istanbul Plus, which, to be very clear, does not envisage any subtraction from what the Ukrainians previously conceded in Istanbul. So I think we will get more moves from the Americans over the next few weeks to try to get some kind of conflict freeze agreed, but I firmly expect the Russians to say no, as, of course, they have already done. Well, that's my summary of the information today, both about the conflict in the Middle East and the conflict in Ukraine. There is, continues to be, a fantastic detachment from reality. I spoke about Shoigu's visit to the Omsk tank factory, only one of many factories that Shoigu is visiting all the time. And I couldn't help but contrast that with a strange article that's appeared in the Daily Telegraph. You can find it today by its former editor, Charles Moore. He is, of course, a fervid supporter of Ukraine, and um, he wants the British authorities to confiscate the little boats that um, the various um, migrants or refugees, if you prefer, who enter Britain illegally crossing the Channel and the North Sea. He wants all of those to be confiscated and to be given to Ukraine in order to help Ukraine with the various operations that Charles Moore continues to believe the Ukrainians are conducting on the east bank of the Dnieper. The lack of connection with reality 
I, I have to say, is astonishing. On the one hand, we see the Russian defense minister touring tank factories and bomb factories and <laughs> missile factories, and we see almost unending quantities of machines and bombs and missiles being churned out. And on the other, we see the former editor of the Daily Telegraph suggesting that what the British should do is give the Ukrainians refugee boats so that they can cross a river. There are times when I really do wonder what planet some people are on. Anyway, there we are. That's my program today. Uh, more from me soon. Let me remind you all again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, uh, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. Don't forget to sh check out our shop. You'll find um, all sorts of amazing things there. Magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's more for, more. That's all from me today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.